everybody, and welcome back to the second episode of the Awaken Together podcast. I'm Kat. I'm Jen. And today we wanted to share with you guys our spiritual awakening stories, what that kind of looked like for each of us, and yeah, what that journey ended up leading to to kind of get us on the trajectory that we are currently at. Um, so Kat is going to start us off and just share a piece of her story and then I'll get into some of mine. So enjoy. Go Kat. <laughs> Buckle up everyone. This yeah. is going to be <laughs> We're getting heavy... extra deep today. We're diving right in because hopefully you'll take a piece of our stories and be like, okay, interesting. I can resonate with some of that. Yes, exactly. That's the point. We're all in this together. So for my story, we're going to take it all the way back to 2007. Um, I was in high school and I had a dark, dark phase of my life. Um, If you follow me on Instagram, I'm no stranger to sharing how messy it was. But to give you just a high level synopsis of this, um, I was in with a crowd that partying was really, really the thing to do. Small town America, you know, not much to do (laughs) in general. So we turned to parties a lot. And it was the cool thing to do. And of course, when you're in high school, that's the goal, right? It was for me anyway. I came from a private school and in the public school immediately, like just got into that crowd. And I had a really toxic ex-boyfriend at that time. Very manipulative, a lot of gaslighting, just not a good time. Wouldn't recommend it. If I could do it all over again, (laughs) I would not date in high school. We all gotta have that one toxic one where you look back and you're like, oh my. (laughs) Everyone's allowed at least one, hopefully just one. one, right? Yes, yes, yes. So in the midst of that, at its worst, I was struggling with an eating disorder. I was being treated for bipolar disorder because I didn't really know what to do with me. My moods were all over the place, Um, but now I know it was hormones and my setting. The whole environment was really not serving me, and I was anxious. I had depression, all of the things on all sorts of medication, starving myself. Um, My relationships weren't really serving me. Of course, I had some best friends who really helped me along through it all, as well as my family, thank goodness for them, or I don't know what would have come of all of that. But yeah, yeah. so really my darkest hour was one night where I'd had a lot to drink, I'd snuck out, my uh, parents didn't know where I was and started calling me, and I was out with that boyfriend and uh, wasn't answering the calls because I didn't know what to say, quite frankly, and Mm -hmm. didn't want them to come find me. (laughs) Yeah. So, oh yeah. So they called the police and went looking for me and found me and I'd had a lot to drink and um, ended up taking me into the hospital and they just didn't know what to do with me. So I remember laying in that hospital bed, drunk. Um, I think I was probably high as well. Just like my mom was crying and I just remember thinking, this is not the kind of life I want to live. This isn't me. And right now, my future does not look bright. So the next day, uh, as you can imagine, living with your parents in high school, having that experience the next day is not fun. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Not pretty. Uh, Probably some unsaid. (laughs) Yes. Yeah. Lots going on there. And so... um, I just made that conscious decision. I kind of had a heart to heart with my parents and made the decision that I needed to visualize what I wanted my future to look like because staying in that messy place that I was in mentally, emotionally, physically, it was not aligned with where I wanted to be. And so I thought of thinking I started thinking about college and where I wanted to go and just dreaming about the future and planning for that because my present wasn't what I wanted. So all of those little steps got me to UMass where I felt like it was a fresh start. It was two hours away from where I lived. First time living outside of my hometown and felt like I could take a deeper breath. Like there was more oxygen out there and my breath could go all the way down to my belly when before that it was only in my chest, really, really shallow. So 
I have like my hands on my heart right now because I'm just like feeling that difference for the first yeah. time was really, really intense and um, made some new friends, kept the old good ones. That relationship ended, <laughs> you know, before I graduated. So that stayed in my hometown and it was a new me coming into college and I kind of reinvented myself. And then sophomore year met my uh, now husband, Kyle, we were next door neighbors in the dorms and things just started to feel a bit brighter. Uh, and then I graduated in 2013 and, um, moved back in with my parents because what do you do after college when you're broke? That's (laughs) one of the only options. Right. Uh And so, um, yeah, I was kind of back in that space of where everything happened and I needed to learn, how I wanted to move forward being back in that space, having changed over four years myself, but also knowing that, you know, I had graduated, I started working. Is this what life is all about now? So I kind of got into a... Such a weird time happens between that, like, college, like, I did the thing, now what is, what is this life? (laughs) Such a weird awakening, kind of a semi-awakening happens, I feel like, for everyone in that, like, college into adulthood. It's, like, one of the most awkward phases, <laughs> like, truly. Yes, exactly. Truly. Any times of transition, whether it's after school, you know, marriage, having a child, like, starting a business, um, any big life changes are just, like, breeding ground for... <laughs> for yeah. hard times and or you can see where you really grown yeah it goes one way or the other it's either like complete chaos or you know you can it either triggers you for your next thing it seems or yeah you can really see what's wrong <laughs> like, yes really exactly yeah. it's like very good or very bad <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> ah, yeah and so I was just feeling lost and I in college had taken a few yoga classes that I liked went to it for the workout but um decided to try another one back in my hometown at a gym and I remember walking in and you know laying out my mat and the teacher's name was Sagarika Ghost. She's my original guru, my OG and uh, she just, she's from India and she just had this way of commanding the room. Such a little woman and there were people in their 40s and 50s balancing on their heads and (laughs) balancing on one hand and extending their bodies in these positions, contorting them in ways that I was like, I want what they're having. So I just kept coming back to that class. And in a time where I was feeling lost myself of, is this what life is all about? Uh, Just working and money and, you know, just doing what I think I'm supposed to be doing. I found a lot of myself in my yoga practice with Sagarika and I became obsessed. I I was doing that twice a week and then quickly it turned to five days a week because on the days where I wasn't with her, I needed, I felt like I needed to return to myself in that same way and yoga was my space in which I could do that. So it became a place for me to come home to myself and and I, it just propelled me on this path of thinking about things differently, really sitting with my emotions, questioning the choices I make and deciding if they are the ones that's going to really get me to where I want to be, being able to focus on my breath, my movements, the present moment really alleviated a lot of my anxiety and got me just so passionate about learning about yogic philosophy, what the gurus have been teaching about for centuries, this ancient wisdom that I could then take into my day to day and see how really the magic could infiltrate Uh, into my joy, into my work, into how I touched other people. And yeah, I'm so grateful Uh, to be able to share that with others now with teaching yoga too. And when did you do teacher training, Kat? I did that in 2014. So I'd actually been practicing yoga seriously for just one year before I decided like, this is for me. This is my thing. I need to do this. (laughs) I love it. 
Yeah. Love it. Uh, such a thank you for sharing all of that. And one of the things that I just want to say about your journey too, it's really incredible that that all happened so young. You know, you got mm-hmm. like kind of such an intense, like early on trek. Like, you know, for some people, that can happen so much later. So you're, you really, you really had all of that waking up start so young. So yes, it's such a good yeah. point. And I'm really grateful for that now. And my mom and I have talked about that and she's my best friend. Like we have, we talk every single day, we're <laughs> really rocky start, but we're, we always <laughs> say now, like how grateful we are that that happened then under their roof when they could support me and, you know, make me see a therapist and, uh, encourage me to, to do good things for myself. Because if I didn't have that, I don't know how I would have turned out. And so, yeah, just every step gets us to where we are right yeah Yeah. wow well I can't wait for everybody to hear your story (laughs) because it is such a beautiful one so would you like to share yes yes yeah Yeah, once again it's another deep trek but we'll go back a little bit so I would say like just to preface um I yeah as I said last episode I grew up in a conservative Christian household Um, So for me, my life was going to church a lot on Wednesdays and Sundays. I was very active in that whole scene. I will say as a kid, I really do think I was like a questioner all the time. Like I really didn't take things that I learned to just like, okay, that's the reality. So I I was a little, I had a little bit of a rebellious edge already to start. We can word it like that. (laughs) Um, But yeah, as I as I went through high school, probably starting more like junior year, I, I think I didn't go to a Christian school, but because I was so involved in church, um, that usually was my, you know, closer circle. But I do think as I got into high school, I started noticing more people partying, got involved in partying, very similar to cats. You know, I think we all go through this kind of like exploration side of ourselves where we take what we you know were given growing up for a lot of us that maybe had yeah certain set beliefs and then you kind of just look at what's around you and and you know explore a little bit um I ended up partying I was drinking a lot but I also ended up being engaged uh really young thinking like yeah, that my trajectory was I found my person and all was good. Um, But as I got deeper into like the partying, I started as I finished high school and got into college, I think, yeah, my church relate, my church boyfriend, my our fiance rather started seeming like a worse choice. Um, I think from then I was like, you know, I th- I still think I have a lot to learn. I'm I'm really getting to know more perspectives. Like so, partying felt like a huge freeing thing at first because it was it was experimenting with completely different people than the circle I was originally a part of. But at that same time, um. One of my biggest goals was to to move out on my own. I remember in high school that was like I was thinking of that all the time. Mm-hmm. So I started college in high school. So I graduated high school with an associate's degree. I had done college throughout. Um, and then I went right into physical therapy school. So here I am like really busting my butt trying to get my physical therapy degree and then also trying to like – explore this like college party scene that was just like so foreign to me and I think the way I really got through intense working in school was I really was told by my parents that they would not support some of my college if I went to a if I didn't go to a Christian school so for me I had this kind of like ego arrogance of like I'll prove everyone wrong like Mm -hmm. watch me I I cannot even believe what I physically used to do like truly working like 40 hours a week going to school 40 hours a week and trying to keep up with a party scene it was just yeah it's a lot for anyone it's it's exhausting to think about (laughs) Yeah, it's awesome right? to think about. I really just wanted to like figure it out. But anyway, well, fast forward. I was in, um, I had finished physical therapy school. I was working. I was living with a bunch of roommates, really still into going out, partying. And I had a night that I had gone out and I had planned for a uh, 
someone to come pick me up. So I was trying to be responsible in that moment. Um, but I ended up drinking way too much and I blacked out, which just was the first time I had had like a straight up blackout. Um, and you fast forward to when I come to, I'm handcuffed to a hospital bed. Mm -hmm. I literally have no idea what happened from the point of the bar to being in this hospital. I have cops around me, yeah, not answering any of my questions. I was so scared in that moment, just like you in the hospital. I remember it with such clarity. Um, I was terrified. This is just a setting I had never even been close to being in. Um, I go into jail. Um, I still have no idea why I was even in there. I couldn't piece it together. Um, So many jail stories. (laughs) I was in there there 36 (laughs) hours. We'll do an episode. We'll do an episode. Yeah. Uh, 36 hours though. And then finally people were able to figure out like where I was. But I I had driven, I found out from my police report, like 40 miles on the interstate ended up getting off in an exit and crashing into like three parked cars um at an at a marina just a random Mm -hmm. random thing but with that the moment that I had to walk out of jail my parents were picking me up I remember this sense of almost kind of relief and surrender because It was like no longer did I have to have this facade of being so strong, being so independent. Like in that moment, I was helpless. I had literally nothing I could control. Mm -hmm. And so for me, yeah, I I had to admit that I needed help in a way, you know, because I needed someone to take me home. I needed like all sorts of stuff came about with that DUI. I ended up losing $26,000. I had Oof. to sell my dog because I just couldn't keep so up with sad. taking care of him without a car. Yeah, and I lost one of my jobs at that time. I had just like so many series of events. So I lost everything that I had thought was me. Um, and the only thing I had was a yoga practice, which I had just like you, Kat, gone to a few yoga classes, like, you know, like them, wasn't obsessed with it, but I had a yoga mat and I just remember I couldn't control anything at that moment. It was like every day a new phone call was coming in, something to figure out. And so I just started rolling my mat out every day. I was having so many panic attacks, like up Mm -hmm. to six a day. And it was like wearing my body out because I just had so many unknowns. And I realized in that moment what a false sense of control that I really had believed was, you know, I, I thought I had it all together and that I was, you know, on top of everything which control is such an illusion anyway, you know? Yeah. And in that moment, everything, I literally lost so many categories across the board. And I just realized, like, the only thing I can control right now is showing up on this mat and breathing to try to calm myself down to know that I am still here and I'm, it's going to be okay. So I remember doing yoga, like, every single day, sometimes twice a day because I was so um, panicked. And so with that started, I ended up leaving Florida, that environment, like this happened really fast, actually. I just left Florida. I moved to a little apartment in the middle of the hills of West Virginia and decided from that point on that I needed to rebuild who I even was because when that facade all left, that sense of control, I was like, well, what is left? Like, I've just lost everything that I've been hustling for for so long. Who even am I? And so I knew at that point, like, I needed to figure all of that out. And that's what really catapulted the entire spiritual journey along with, like, a way more developed yoga practice as well. So, so wild. Both of our stories, like, kind of, like, started on the yoga mat in a way and in, like, the party scene, you know, but... Even the correlations there are so interesting. (laughs) Like, yeah, red thread between both of our stories is we found yoga or yoga found us in moments of hopelessness, (laughs) right? Yeah. Yeah. And oh my goodness, that identity shift for you too. I mean, pre-car accident to post, it really seems like 
it stripped you of a lot of things and I'm just so impressed and amazed by the way that you've rebuilt your life in a way that actually seems to be a lot more aligned than how it was before. Would you agree? And same for you. Yes, literally same for you. And so, yeah, that's the interesting part of the spiritual journey. You know, we can go into a lot of like theories on this, but for some, they can consciously choose the spiritual journey and, you know, start start kind of dabbling into it. But I do think a lot of people, it, you really have this like pivotal moment. It's like a moment where, yeah, it's like something more divine is telling you like this is not um, – this is not where you're supposed to be. There is like a bigger soul journey for you. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Let's redirect your attention to something else. And I mean – yeah, here I've heard so many stories of people having these like big kind of like moments that start it. And so for both of us, like we didn't really have an active role in choosing it so much as like it just kind of found us. And that is what is so interesting about this journey is there are some conscious choices for sure. Always there's always choices that that will direct like what's going to be the next thing. But there is, you know, we, <laughs> this is the whole thing, but there is this energy that is taking care of us. And I do think when we get into this, like stripping away of what elements we think we are identity wise, when all of those get either stripped away by choice or kind of by circumstances that lead to that, you realize that beneath all of it, you don't have like, you know, there's not like a sense of control. Sense of control is so such a false belief because there's always going to be things without, with uh, you know, not within your control. And mm-hmm. so, yeah, when you start having these little baby steps just leading to a totally different trek or you have one big thing like catapulting you to the next trek it is just so interesting. <laughs> I so agree. So beautifully said. And it kind of, I just got this visualization of a forest fire and how even after forest fire the roots underground stay alive and it's the time for them to really just grow underground and sprout new life and it's gonna look different than it did before but it's no less beautiful it can even be more beautiful and if there's one thing that we all are it's resilient and (laughs) tear us down we'll get back up and we'll come back tenfold so if we can do it you can too Yes, I love it. So yeah, that was pieces of our story with the awakening. We will definitely go into um, kind of what, you know, what what spirituality even means. I think that would be a really good topic to hone in on because there is definitely like different ways to view all of this. I like to think of it as a baseline as being a divine energy that comes in and is just here to work with you when you strip all that stuff away. So I think next week, our next episode rather, (laughs) um, talking about how to even identify what parts of you are personality versus what parts of you are your soul, you know, and kind of that like more Mm -hmm. intuitive side of yourself is a really great place to start because even when you have these shifts so perhaps for some of you 2020 was that like oh crap moment where you couldn't control anything and you knew like you know your normal things couldn't work I think for some maybe this happened before but for 2020 it was probably the biggest collective awakening um Mm -hmm. But I think after that point, you know that work has to be done and you feel kind of more guided. But I think a huge part of for for me next step was figuring out that difference of like what what I what I have actually created as my identities versus yeah, like which of these things are not actually me? Like, why am I even fighting to prove that I'm some of these things, you know? Mm, so, yeah. What do you th- Yeah. Getting to choose what parts of you you want to keep and what parts you 
aren't actually you, (laughs) right? That identity of the human experience, separating that from your soul and what you've carried into this life, maybe from past lives. Yeah. Yeah, we can get into past lives too. Yeah, yeah. so tune in for our next episode. We will go into that kind of personality versus soul. And I thank you, Kat, for sharing your story. It feels so good to kind of review and talk about it all. I'm so happy to be on this journey with you. Oh, same. So grateful. (laughs) (laughs) Okay, talk later. Okay, bye.